So far in this module, we've uh, looked at some reasons not to lecture. We've also looked at some roles that lecture might play in the undergraduate STEM classroom. I feel like if we're going to talk about lecturing, we have to talk a little bit about slides. Uh, typically PowerPoint slides, but Keynote and other, other programs as well. Uh, not all college lecturers use slides, but a lot do. But a lot don't do them very well. Uh, here's a photo I took at a conference a, a, a few years back. I won't say who's speaking or what the conference was, but just imagine yourself. I'm kind of near the back of the room and I'm, I'm, I'm watching this presentation. There's a person at the podium speaking, uh, and this slide comes up. And now I have to decide, am I going to listen to the person talking? Or am I going to read all the text that's on this slide? I really can't do both, unfortunately. And so this is what we see a lot. This is sometimes called death by PowerPoint, when there's so much text on the slide that you're not really sure where to attend. Do you pay attention to the person talking, or do you read what's on the slide? There's a term for this. It's called cognitive load. And it's the idea that we can only kind of process so much information uh, at once. Now, the way this applies to PowerPoint slides and other types of slides is that we may think that the person talking kind of is one channel of information, and, and it's all verbal, right? It's all textual. And on the slides, it's all visual, right? We're using our eyes and our ears to process the slides. However, we actually kind of have two paths in our brain. One is verbal and one is visual. But when we're reading, when we're reading text on a slide, um, that's using the verbal path. And so that's why we get this cognitive load when we see slides like this. We really have trouble processing both what we're hearing and what we're reading at the same time. Now, uh, there's a great quote by uh, Gar Reynolds, author of a book called Presentations In. He says, slides are slides, documents are documents. They aren't the same thing. Attempts to merge them result in what I call the slide you meant. So I think that's kind of funny. He's, uh, his book, Presentations Zen, is just fantastic. It was really my introduction to the idea of using more visuals and more effective visuals in presentations. And so it's, it's definitely a good read. So that's a bit about cognitive load. There's a, there's a kind of flip side to this. So this is what happens when we're kind of working cognitive load the wrong way. But what if we kind of tap into those, uh, those two streams, right, the, the, the verbal and the visual, and use them to our advantage? Well, here's a quote from another author of a really fantastic book on presentations, Nancy Duarte. She says, when the right visuals and words are used together, they create a third kind of experience, one that operates by unifying mind and emotion. That's why advertising works, or drama, or film, or the best presentations. And I will say, we may not have a ton of drama and emotion in the college classroom, but this idea that the visuals and words are actually working together and complementing each other that's pretty powerful. Again, Nancy's book, Slideology, is really fantastic. It's, a, it's another recommended read if you'd like more, more on how to put together presentations. I will say that both uh, Reynolds and Duarte focus largely on the business community, so it may take a little bit of translation if you're, if you're going to use these in the science classroom. But what she's getting at is this uh, term uh, called dual coding. And so this is the idea that we, we do have this kind of verbal channel and we have this visual channel. And when they're actually working together, when they're kind of synced up, uh, that they reinforce each other. So what you're seeing on screen is a NASA satellite photo of uh, rivers coming together in Paraguay. Uh, this is called a confluence of rivers. Uh, and so this is kind of my uh, visual representation of this idea of dual coding. You've got your verbal stream, you've got your visual stream, and when they come together, they really reinforce each other. Um, and so if you've got um, visuals that are complementing and not competing with your spoken delivery, you'll actually ha help students to understand and remember what you're talking about more effectively. So what might this look like in the, in the college classroom? Well, let's look at a few examples just briefly from um, a few classes that I've taught. This is from a cryptography course that I teach occasionally. And we look at the history of cryptography. And one of the things we talk about is how the advent of technologies like the telegraph changed the world of encryption and cryptography. So for this slide, I have some text on the slide. It's not a lot. It's this one statement at the top. The advent of the telegraph created a need for stronger encryption. And then below it, I've got this kind of diagram that we used to kind of work this through. And I won't get into the details, but we kind of imagined this situation where there was a code breaker, and we imagined how this process would happen with and without the telegraph. So what I've done is I've used this structure that's sometimes called assertion evidence. I put my assertion at the top, one nice fairly short sentence, and then I've got my evidence underneath it. 
And so during class, we've got this diagram that we can look at together. I can kind of walk through uh, the diagram with students. I can have them respond to it. Um, in STEM classrooms, we're often looking at different kinds of diagrams and figures. And so that can be a really effective thing to put on your slide, not with a bunch of text on it, but as a, a, a learning aid uh, that you want your students to, to make some sense of. Here's another type of uh, visualization that you'll see a lot in STEM classrooms, and that's some type of data visualization. And this was taken from a uh, statistics course that I taught. It's not the best data visualization. And in fact, it's one of a series we were looking at different ways to visualize the same data set. In this case, uh, there's a data visualization, and, and there's data to look at. There's stories to be told here, right? There's sense to be made of this. Uh, that's a, a nice thing to put up on the screen. Uh, you can imagine uh, maybe modeling some expert thinking. How would I an analyze this? How I might invite students to come up and analyze it as well? Uh, this is a, a certainly an appropriate use of visuals. I will say, though, that if your data visualization is fairly complex, students may need a hard copy of it as well. Just seeing it from the back of the classroom may not be sufficient to do the kind of analysis they need. So keep in mind that handouts may be your friends. Here's one more example. I've found in recent years that I really like using this tool called Prezi. The thing I like about Prezi is that it gives you this wide open canvas. And you can put your content, words, pictures, whatever you want, anywhere you want on that canvas. Then as you're going through your presentation, uh, you can pan and zoom around the canvas and show different aspects of, of, of what you want to show. Um, the thing that's really powerful about this is that at some point, usually near the end of the presentation, you can zoom out and see the entire presentation. You can show students the big picture. As we know, students often have trouble um, figuring out that big picture and seeing how different ideas and concepts and techniques uh, relate to each other. Uh, having a visualization of that can be a really effective classroom tool, helping them to kind of see, to give them some tools for making sense of how things are connected to each other. And so sometimes a visualization is a, a, a big picture is a really useful tool. Um, I will say that I wouldn't just show this image. Uh, we would have started down in the weeds somewhere and looked at little bits and pieces of it so that by the time we zoom out and see the whole thing, they already have some understanding of what all those parts are and can start to think a little bit about how the parts go together. Finally, I'll point out one visual tool that I've been using a lot in my presentations for this course uh, is the idea of an image as metaphor. And so I said earlier this was a, a confluence of two rivers. I had this idea of dual coding I wanted you to understand and remember. And so what I did was I found a visual metaphor for that idea. I have to say, it took me a little while to remember the term confluence. But once I did, I was able to search and find a photo that kind of worked for this idea. The idea here is that, um, in terms of images metaphor, is that if you um, provide a narrative or a textual description of some concept, maybe a tough concept, and you also have an image that works as a sort of visual metaphor for that concept, you'll help students understand that concept and remember it because you're kind of activating both of those streams, the, the verbal and the visual. Um, I know that I find myself often remembering these images that represent complex ideas, um, and that's a way that I can kind of retain information and access it quickly. So four quick strategies for using better visuals in your lectures. Uh, the assertion evidence structure, using data visualizations, showing students the big picture, and then using images as metaphors. And I should say the metaphor doesn't always work in all STEM classrooms, but sometimes it's very helpful. What I'd like you to do is, um, uh, when you finish this video, um, go into the course pages. We've provided some more resources around using visuals and presentations, and I'd invite you to do a little PowerPoint makeover. Take a couple of PowerPoint slides that um, are maybe a little text heavy uh, and see if you can uh, remake them using stronger visuals. And uh, we encourage you to share what you've done in the forums.